Hey guys, how's it going? In this video we're going to look at the Lorentz factor, which is something that can appear in time dilation as well as length contraction. So let's get started. It says here that we can rewrite our equation for time dilation in terms of the Lorentz factor, which we give the symbol gamma. So we say that t prime equals gamma times t, where gamma is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v over c squared. So remember for the time dilation equation we had this term but just with the t on the top. So because we can define the Lorentz factor as this, that means we can rewrite t prime as gamma times t. And if you multiply a fraction by t, you would just get t on the top there. Now we can look more closely at this equation and try and make sense of it. And it shows here a graph of the Lorentz factor versus speed, which is measured as a multiple of the speed of light. And if we look at this graph, we can try and work out what's going on. So we're plotting the Lorentz factor gamma on the y-axis against the speed on the x-axis which is a fraction of the speed of light so it's v divided by c and if we plot a graph like this we'll get a curve with a shape that looks like this. So we start off linear to begin with and then it starts curving up the way and then we get a much steeper curve going up the way here. And what's going on here is it says down the bottom we can see that for small speeds i.e. less than 0.1 times the speed of light the Lorentz factor is approximately 1 and relativistic effects are negligibly small. So that is down this end, so for relatively low speeds, less than 0.1 times the speed of light, so that's around here, we can see we've very much got a linear relationship where gamma is equal to 1. So if we look back at our equation for the Lorentz factor, or even the time dilation equation t prime equals gamma t written in terms of the Lorentz factor, if we're saying that gamma is equal to 1, then we simply get that t prime is approximately equal to the time. And that's what we experience in everyday life. Because remember we said that in classical relativity for everyday objects, the speeds are going to be less than 10% the speed of light. So we're going to be dealing with non-relativistic velocities. So for non-relativistic velocities, gamma is equal to 1, and the effects of time dilation are not visible. However, if we now consider the speeds to be greater than 10% the speed of light, you'll see that gamma starts increasing above 1. So that means we are going to have some effects from time dilation. And then eventually, when we get up to very much near the speed of light, you'll see that we get a rapid spike in our value for gamma. And that means that if we look back at our equation for time dilation, gamma is going to be tending closer to a value of 10. That means that the relativistic time t prime is going to be about 10 times the proper time. And that means we're seeing clear time dilation here, apparent increases in time. It then says that, however, the speed of satellites is fast enough that even these small changes, i.e. the small changes seen around here, will add up over time and seriously affect the synchronization of global positioning systems, i.e. GPS, and television satellites for users on the air. These satellites therefore have to be specially programmed to adapt for the effects of special relativity, these effects of time dilation. Lastly, it says that very precise measurements of these small changes in time have been performed on fast-moving aircraft and agree with predicted results within experimental error. So these effects of time dilation with satellites, although small, can add up and cause significant changes. So we do need to correct for those when we're using satellites. That's all for this video, folks. I hope you found it useful. If you did, give it a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.